Hey guys, today I'll show you a science fiction thriller TV series named The 100 Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with the Earth's surviving descendants, the Mountain Men, releasing the Red Fog to knock out the remaining rest of the 100 delinquents who were sent previously to Earth from the Ark space station. Clark and Monty were among them, and when Clark awoke, she found herself in a quarantine room at Mount Weather. Meanwhile, Kane, Abigail, and others had also returned to Earth aboard the Ark. After some time, Clark noticed that Monty's room across from hers was empty. She shattered the glass to escape her room and took a disinfecting girl hostage, demanding to be taken to Monty. They took the elevator to the fifth floor where Clark was stunned by what she saw. The people there were dressed elegantly, leisurely enjoying fine dining. A woman noticed them and screamed in terror that quarantine had failed, prompting everyone to drop their utensils and flee the scene while covering their mouths and noses. Clark was then handcuffed by the guards. Later, an elderly man, known as the President here, came to Clark, shook her hand and said they had taken 48 of their people into their protection, but the rest have not yet been found. Clark was skeptical and wanted to verify this for herself. The President agreed and ordered that a box of clothing be brought to her before she met him in the hall. The box was filled with attire and shoes that a young girl might like. Clark secretly removed the heel from a pair of high heels and hid it. Afterward, as they walked, the President began to explain the facilities here, such as the hydroelectric power station and hydroponic farms. He said the high radiation levels of Earth are not suited for the mountain men, but the sky people are different. Due to the intense radiation in space, the sky people's metabolism has become exceptionally robust in dealing with radiation. Just before the elevator doors closed, the president asked Clark to hand over the hidden heel, telling her she no longer had to fight for survival and welcome her to Mount Weather. Upon arriving at the dining hall, Clark indeed saw her friends Monty and Jasper, and they embraced warmly. They seemed content with their new surroundings, lost in bliss, but Clark remained worried. She lowered her voice and pointed at Monty and Jasper with the map, saying that the map didn't show any exits. She needed them to tell her about the rooms, corridors, and exits they had seen. However, Jasper had no desire to leave, relishing a life free from pursuit, hunger, and cold. Monty mentioned that these mountain men were searching for other survivors and had more advanced technology, but to Clark, the comforts offered felt eerily too good to be true. The disinfecting girl taken hostage earlier was named Maya. While Jasper was chatting up Maya, Clark managed to steal her access card, but Maya noticed and rushed after her with Jasper in tow. As the guards gave chase, Clark sprinted through the doors and up a long evacuation corridor, almost reaching the door that led outside. Just then, Jasper and Maya arrived. Maya aimed a gun at Clark, while Jasper pleaded in tears with Clark not to open the door, as the mountain men couldn't withstand any radiation and she would kill them all by doing so. Clark relented and was handcuffed by the guards who arrived shortly after. Elsewhere in the forest, Bellamy got separated from Finn, but he encountered two other missing members of the Hundred. They witnessed a grounder tie Finn and another boy behind a horse. When the boy couldn't keep up due to exhaustion, his throat was brutally slit. Bellamy decided to distract the grounder while the girl attempted a rescue. However, when Bellamy emerged shouting from the bushes, a frightened girl failed to appear. Outmatched, Bellamy was inevitably captured. Seeing this, the girl and another companion finally mustered the courage to charge out, only to find the grounder collapse as Kane and his group emerged from the bushes for the rescue, showing that the survivors from the Ark had successfully arrived on Earth. Meanwhile, the defected grounder, Lincoln, discovered the arrow in Octavia's leg was poisoned, but he had used all his antidote on Finn to save Raven. He wanted to take her back to his village for more antidote, but Octavia stopped him, knowing his people now saw him as a traitor, and it was too risky. Reluctantly, Lincoln scoured the riverbank for beetles to refine the antidote. But as soon as he left, a scream came from Octavia's direction. Lincoln rushed back to find Octavia suffering from the poison, burning with fever. Without delay, he carried her towards the village, unaware that a fierce-looking creature was observing them from the undergrowth. After an arduous journey, Lincoln made it to the outskirts of the village. Octavia felt it was too risky for Lincoln to enter, but he insisted, saying he couldn't watch her die before disappearing into the village. The unconscious raven wasn't taken by the mountain men. While the grounder responsible for watching Murphy entered the spaceship, she shot him dead. She wanted to take revenge on Murphy, but to her dismay, she had run out of bullets. Seeing Raven coughing up blood, Murphy surprisingly approached with concern to help her turn over. 
Then Raven learned about Murphy's past. His father had tried to steal medicine to save his sick son, but was caught and executed. Since then, his mother began to drink heavily, and before she died, she resented her son for causing her husband's death. Looking at Murphy with tears in his eyes, Raven felt a surge of compassion, and therefore, when Dr. Abigail arrived, she did not expose Murphy, only saying that she had been shot. When Bellamy saw Murphy, he couldn't contain his anger and tackled him to the ground. However, Kane ordered his men to shock Bellamy with a taser and then bound him. Finn rushed over to plead and explain the situation, but Kane didn't care. He coldly told Bellamy that they had laws now. Finn comforted Bellamy, saying once they got back to the space station, they would get supplies and guns and then go find their missing friends. But right now, Raven needed surgery or she would die, so they had got to go. Before leaving, Abigail carved on the spaceship, leaving location information for her daughter Clark. At that time, the guards brought Clark to the president of the Mountain Men. The president said that when the first invaders appeared 56 years ago, his father believed that Earth would recover. So he opened the door, but within a week, 45 of the Mountain Men died from radiation, including his mother and sister. He told Clark that they had searched all areas, including the camp and the Ark, and found no survivors. Clark didn't believe it and wanted to go out to see for herself, but this time the president did not agree. In the evening, Clark and her friends joined the president in prayer and gratitude, enjoying a lavish dinner. After returning to the dormitory, she saw the paints the president had given her, but this did not shake her determination to leave. She firmly marked the exit she had seen on the map. Meanwhile, Kane led everyone back to the camp, and since they still couldn't make contact with Judge Thalon, who was still in space, the acting Judge Kane naturally assumed the role. At that time, Judge Thalon in space was looking at the photo of his son, Wells, on the screen. Dr. Abigail excitedly described to Judge Thalon the beautiful sights of Earth she had seen. After learning that the survivors had reached Earth, Judge Thalon turned off the device and awaited his demise. However, at that moment, he suddenly heard the cry of a baby. The scene changes. The ARC team was busy with their own tasks in the camp when suddenly someone spotted a shadow moving in the bushes, causing a panic. Kane ordered his men to form teams and search the woods. At that time, an alarm went off in Mount Weather. Maya said that the ground patrol had returned and someone needed treatment. Clark and Jasper also arrived at the quarantine area, and seeing the wounds on the deceased, Clark couldn't help but feel suspicious. Soon after, a man whose body was ravaged by radiation was brought in. He had something resembling a bottle cap on his chest. Clark then found the president and inquired about the condition of the injured. The president said that the patrol had gone out to look for her companions and were attacked by grounders. But Clark thought that the wounds on the deceased didn't seem like the work of grounders. So the president took her to the infirmary to examine the body. Clark pointed to the bottle cap-like object and asked what it was. Dr. Singh said it was a dialysis shunt. Everyone had them to protect against radiation. The president and Dr. Singh turned the body over to show Clark that it was indeed an arrow wound and gave her the arrowhead to examine. Clark didn't say much, but she was still skeptical, suspecting that they had faked the wounds. Jasper thought Clark was crazy to not enjoy the good life they had. At that moment, Judge Thalon in space followed the sound and found a baby in a cupboard. He took the baby into his arms, overwhelmed with emotion. He was determined to send the child back to Earth to survive. After some thought, he came up with a wild idea, to use a ship-to-ground missile to return to Earth. So, he hugged the baby close, put on a protective suit, and strapped on an oxygen tank. After that, he initiated the missile launch countdown. Then he burst out of the spaceship, flew through the ring, and landed, crawling into the airlock. He had succeeded, but the baby was nowhere to be found. Panicking and on the verge of collapse, his deceased son, Wells, suddenly appeared behind him. He realized he was hallucinating due to lack of oxygen, but it all felt so real. Wells urged him to get a grip because everyone still needed him. Judge Thalon looked at his son, saying how much he missed him every day and longed to be reunited. But Wells replied he had always been with him, and he could definitely do it. Encouraged by his son, he checked the equipment and climbed into the missile after dismantling the warhead. Back at Earth's camp, Dr. Abigail approached Raven, telling her the bullet was still moving inside her and pressing against her spine. But removing it could be life-threatening, and the surgery would be extremely painful since they didn't have anesthetics. Yet Raven chose to undergo the surgery. Fortunately, Abigail successfully performed the operation on Raven. 
Just then, a scream of agony came from the woods. It turned out that of the three people sent out to patrol, two had been impaled with spears and were dead, with only the one in the middle still alive. Seeing that Raven had survived the surgery, Kane felt a heartfelt admiration for the courage of these children. He told Abigail that Bellamy wanted to go out and search for the others, but they had to think long term and figure out exactly who the enemy they were up against was. Abigail was angry that Kane had still not sent out a search party to find the missing kids, but Kane said he was resolute in ensuring the camp's safety before sending out a search team. Turning to Octavia, she woke up at the entrance to the village to find a stranger crouching before her. The man, who introduced himself as Nico, Lincoln's friend, administered an antidote to Octavia. After a while, Octavia was detoxified. He urged Octavia to flee, explaining that Lincoln's help had brought grave consequences upon the tribe, leaving them defenseless against the Reapers. He said that Lincoln had to answer for his actions. Seeing Nico unwilling to rescue Lincoln, Octavia ambushed him and at knife point forced him into the village. Learning that Nico was the tribe's only doctor, Octavia was even more determined to have the Grounders' leader bring Lincoln to her before nightfall in exchange for Nico. Although the bullet had been removed, Raven's left leg nerve was severely damaged, and she would need crutches to move around. She was in tears, but she resolutely urged Finn to leave her side and go find their dispersed group. At dusk, Finn and Bellamy took handguns provided by Abigail and Miller's father and set out quietly under the moonlight. Meanwhile, Octavia finally saw an injured Lincoln hobbling towards him. But just at the moment of their reunion, a reaper suddenly appeared and ambushed them. Octavia was knocked unconscious, and in a daze he saw Lincoln being taken away by the reaper. At the same time, Judge Thalen finally returned to Earth aboard the missile. Looking up at the starry night sky, he whispered a silent farewell. After dinner, Clark recognized the previously decaying man who had needed support to walk. But now he was moving around as if he were a perfectly normal person, a testament to astonishing medical advancement. Determined to uncover the truth, Clark painfully reopened the scabbed wound on her arm and returned to the medical room. She noticed that the blood in the dialysis shunt came from a pipe on the wall that extended behind the door, which could only be opened with a security card. At a loss, she discovered the vent above. Climbing through it, she was horrified to see two people hung upside down, their blood flowing into a pipe. More shockingly, living people imprisoned in cages like animals, including the leader of the Grounders, Anya. Clark managed to pick the lock on Anya's cage, avoided the doctor's inspection, and after rescuing Anya, the two hurriedly opened the door to the quarantine zone. But as soon as they entered, the door locked behind them. While they were looking at each other in confusion, the floor beneath them suddenly gave way, and they fell through without warning. They slid into a horrifying pile of corpses, where Anya spotted a barely alive companion faintly breathing. Clark urged her to escape, but Anya refused to abandon her friend. Just then, a reaper staggered their way. Clark pushed Anya into a cart and then hid inside it herself. They posed as dead bodies and the reaper wheeled them away. Later, they seized the opportunity to escape while the reaper was distracted. Anya, however, had grander plans and didn't want to accompany Clark. She disappeared in the blink of an eye. Clark wanted to go back for her, but heard the reaper's voice and had no choice but to run for her life. However, she was quickly surrounded by reapers. At the critical moment, a mountain man appeared, holding a frequency emitter, causing the reapers to clutch their heads in agony. As Clark was about to be caught and the guards prepared to take her back to Mount Weather, Anya reappeared and pounced on the mountain men, saving Clark. The two ran for their lives, only to find that the tunnel ended in a cliff with a massive, roaring waterfall below. Anya didn't hesitate and jumped down by herself, leaving Clark behind. The mountain men urged Clark to surrender, but she feigned dropping her weapon and as they let their guard down, took a running leap into the waterfall. Back at the base, Kane noticed that Bellamy, Finn, and some other members of the Hundred were missing. He confronted Abigail, accusing her of releasing the delinquents and providing them with weapons. Abigail didn't deny it and didn't see anything wrong with her actions. The Major told Kane that Abigail had illegally used firearms without authorization and aiding and abetting a jailbreak was a serious crime. The punishment for her was whipping. While they were talking, the Ark Patrol caught a grounder, and the residents went wild, with some even trying to snatch the guards' guns to avenge their children, accidentally injuring themselves in the process. Kane ordered the Major to arrest Abigail for her crime. Publicly and with a heavy heart, he ordered Abigail to be whipped. 
After the punishment, Cain went to Abigail's tent, saying he would order them to be brought back, but this would be a formal diplomatic negotiation with the commander of the Grounders. Abigail was worried Cain would fall into a trap set by the Grounders and wanted to accompany him, but Cain insisted she stay behind to set a good example for their people. He handed her the judge's badge, asking her to take over his position in his absence, and then Cain set off with the Grounder prisoner and two guards. At this moment, Anya dragged the unconscious Clark to the shore. After spitting out a mouthful of water, Clark woke up. She was about to thank Anya for saving her life and invite her back to their dropship when unexpectedly Anya picked up a rock and smashed it towards her, declaring she wouldn't go back to her dropship. Since the Sky People had killed 300 of her warriors, she couldn't return without accomplishing anything. Meanwhile, Finn and Bellamy, along with their group, made their way through the forest to the outskirts of the Grounder's village. Through his scope, Finn spotted the one-eyed Grounder wearing Clark's watch, which stirred his emotions. He instructed Murphy to create a distraction to draw the one-eyed Grounder's attention, followed by a surprise attack that captured him and brought him back to the refuge. Despite their interrogation, the one-eyed Grounder insisted that he found the watch outside the camp of the Hundred and had never seen any girl. Murphy suggested that their torture was too lenient, as he was surely lying. Incensed, Finn pummeled the one-eyed Grounder to a pulp. Hysterically pointing a gun at him, he demanded the truth. The Grounder then lied, claiming their friends were imprisoned in a prisoner village and drew a map, urging them to rescue them quickly before it was too late. After examining the map, Bellamy prepared to lead the group to the prisoner village to rescue their friends, leaving the one-eyed Grounder temporarily in the bunker. Murphy stirred up trouble again, proposing they kill the Grounder. Bellamy refused, and as the argument escalated, Finn shockingly ended the one-eyed Grounder's life, grabbed the map and stormed out, leaving the group present in utter astonishment. At the same time, Lincoln's people were preparing to seek revenge on the Reapers. However, Octavia appeared at the entrance of the village wishing to join them to rescue Lincoln. The leader ordered her death, but Octavia managed to escape. She followed the Grounders, willing to lie on the ground as bait. The ruse was successful, several Reapers were killed, and Octavia even saved the leader's life. But Lincoln was not among the rescued Grounders. Overwhelmed with grief, Octavia's wails echoed to the skies. Nico, with regret, told her that Lincoln was a good man and his brother, then turned to leave with his fellow tribespeople. In Mount Weather, Monty had a premonition that something had happened to Clark. But Jasper didn't take it seriously until breakfast time when Clark still hadn't shown up, and Monty mentioned she didn't come back to sleep last night. Jasper wanted Maya to use her job as a pretext to find out the whereabouts of Clark. Soon after, Maya learned from a friend that Clark had a mental breakdown, so she was locked up in the psychiatric ward under surveillance, and they wouldn't allow visits for a few days. At that moment, the mountain men were injecting the Reapers in the tunnels with drugs. Dr. Singh observed the newly captured Grounders, assigning them to different groups. She planned to include Lincoln in the Cerberus Project, which was the code name of the Mountain Men Project, to create subservient soldiers, known as Reapers. Meanwhile, Judge Thalon from the Space Monitoring Station returned to Earth aboard a missile. In the vast desert, a scavenging boy found the unconscious Thalon. Thinking he was dead, the boy tried to take the chess piece from his pocket, but Thalon suddenly woke up and snatched back the chess piece. The kind boy took Thalon to his home. Although his parents weren't welcoming to Thalon, they let him stay and served him a meal of bugs. During their conversation, Thalon learned that he was in the Dead Zone, a necessary route to the City of Light, one that is free of pain, hate, disease, and suffering. The boy removed his mask, and Thalon saw his face, twisted and deformed from radiation, a congenital malformation. The boy's mother said that their people couldn't accept such a child, but she and her husband didn't want to give up on him, which is why they left their community to come here. Thalon gave the knight chess piece to the boy and drew a chessboard, ready to teach him chess. But soon after, the panicked boy came running in to report that bad people were coming to capture Thalon because they surely saw him fall from the sky and he must run. But Thalon didn't run, fearing the boy's family would be implicated because of him. The boy was frantic, but he didn't expect that those bad people were notified by his own father. His mother, resigned, said they could get a bounty by catching the Sky People, and they needed to go to the City of Light. But Thalon didn't blame them, and thus he was captured by them. Elsewhere, Anya was leading Clark through the forest with a rope, but it wasn't long before the mountain men were on their trail again. To camouflage themselves, the two smeared mud on their faces and bodies. However, they still couldn't shake off their pursuers. 
Clark noticed that Anya had a tracking device implanted in her arm. She wanted Anya to release her so she could help remove it, but to her surprise, the tough Anya ripped the tracker out with her teeth. Finn and others followed the map and entered the grounder's territory. Murphy was complaining about the unknown danger, and even Bellamy thought that the one-eyed grounder had given up the information under the threat of a gun, uncertain if he was lying. It was then they discovered several bodies by the roadside. As they moved forward, they came across the fallen ark. Suddenly, they heard a woman's cries for help from below the cliff. A girl was hanging from a tree trunk, recognized by a boy as his friend from space. Finn was intent on rescuing Clark and didn't want to waste time here, but the boy had already tied himself with a rope and was descending the cliff when the knot couldn't bear his weight and he fell into the abyss dying on impact. His friends were stunned and the girl hanging from the tree was terrified. Bellamy encouraged the girl to hold on while instructing others to look for ropes and safety belts in the wreckage of the ship. Bellamy then secured a makeshift rope out of safety belts and descended to the girl. Everyone pulled together, and just as they were about to reach the top, grounders ambushed them with hidden arrows. The other girl was unfortunately hit in the leg. In this life-or-death moment, the sound of a foghorn rang out, causing the grounders to abandon their attack. The delinquents worked together to pull Bellamy and the girl to safety. Just then, Octavia appeared. It was she who had blown the foghorn and lured the grounders away. The siblings, having endured much hardship, were reunited and embraced. The girl's wound was potentially poisonous and needed immediate treatment at the camp. Therefore, they split into two groups. Bellamy led the others back to the camp, while Finn and Murphy continued towards the grounder village to rescue Clark. At the camp, an electrical grid had been constructed, and the mechanic had designed a leg brace for Raven, who finally overcame her psychological barriers and put it on. The device was effective. Raven could now move freely without crutches. She also came up with a method to boost the signal strength. While treating Anya's wounds, Clark inserted a tranquilizer dart into her neck, making Anya her captive once again. But when Clark dragged the unconscious Anya back to their camp, she saw a location message left by her mother earlier. Anya woke up and engaged in a fierce fight with Clark. As Anya raised her knife to strike at Clark's heart, Clark pressed on her wounded arm, forcing her to release her grip. Clark then grabbed a skull and struck Anya on the head before counterattacking. Anya was overpowered and on the verge of being killed when Clark spotted a signal balloon in the distance. She dropped the dagger, exclaiming that her friends had arrived. In reality, it was Raven's idea to use the balloon to improve the signal strength, but the Major shot it down, fearing it would expose the location of the camp. In the evening, Clark brought Anya to the vicinity of the camp and released her, saying their cooperation is the only chance to fight against the Mountain Men. To defeat them, they need the Mountain Men's technology and the Grounder's knowledge of the world. The two finally set aside their differences. Anya mentioned that the Grounder's commander was once her second in command, and she could try to persuade her. After shaking hands and parting ways, Anya was only a few steps away when she was shot dead by a bullet from the camp. Clark was also hit and fell unconscious. Taken as a Grounder back to the camp, Clark was immediately recognized by her mother, Dr. Abigail. Clark recounted her experiences of being taken back to Mount Weather by the Mountain Men. Abigail was overjoyed and wept, not expecting to see her mother again. Mother and daughter embraced each other. The next day, as Clark stepped out of the tent, she saw Raven, who had waited all night. Seeing Raven's leg, Clark felt deep compassion for her. Then Bellamy arrived at the camp with others. Clark excitedly ran towards them, understanding how difficult it was to be reunited. But she noticed Finn was not among them. At that moment, Finn and Murphy were lying in wait in the trees outside the prisoner village, observing every move through their scopes. Murphy thought the village, inhabited only by the old women and children, didn't look like a place where prisoners would be kept, but Finn refused to believe it. In the subsequent meeting at the camp, Abigail decided not to send out search parties for Finn and Murphy due to limited manpower. However, Clark believed that the lives of the two were in constant danger and that not searching for them would further deteriorate relations with the Grounders. Bellamy also thought Abigail's handling of the situation was inappropriate. As a result, Clark and Bellamy took advantage of Abigail's surgical duties to quietly take guns and slip out of the camp to search for Finn and Murphy. Bellamy told Clark that war had changed Finn. The pain of losing her made him numb. When he killed the one-eyed grounder, he did not even blink as he pulled the trigger. Clark could hardly believe her ears. Meanwhile, the president's son, Cage, had Lincoln tied up and injected him with a red drug. Soon after, he administered a second dose and turned on a frequency emitter to record the maximum duration Lincoln could withstand the drug using his willpower. 
He also instructed his men to increase the dosage and use shock therapy on Lincoln every two hours, moving to the second phase whenever he felt fear. Then they brought in another grounder who had been injected with the drug, using the red injector as bait. As expected, the two fought fiercely over it, and Lincoln quickly killed the other man, eagerly injecting the drug into himself like it was a narcotic. At the same time, the president of Mount Weather found Jasper and informed him that Clark had escaped, telling him she could leave any time if he wished to find her. Jasper told Monty about this, but Monty didn't believe Clark would abandon them and leave on her own. He decided to look for her and then began packing his belongings. Suddenly, Maya's skin began to deteriorate. She realized the isolation had failed. Maya was then taken to the medical room where her condition deteriorated rapidly, with blisters covering most part of her body. Dr. Singh declared standard treatment ineffective and recommended trying an unconventional therapy using Jasper's ability to filter radiation. They would transfer Maya's blood into Jasper's body, circulate it, and then transfuse it back into Maya. Monty thought this was too risky, but Jasper agreed. Surprisingly, the treatment was successful, and Maya was quickly cured. At this point, the president called Dr. Singh out, revealing that he did not approve of her experimenting on the Sky People. However, Dr. Singh didn't care, claiming that the first human trial had been successful and that she would continue research on the other 47 of the 100. The president was opposed and didn't believe the narrative about the isolation failure, suspecting that it was a situation orchestrated by his son. The scene shifts to Kane, who had walked a long way and reached the land of the grounders. To demonstrate his sincerity, he discarded his weapons and untied the grounder captive. Following the captive alone, he entered their camp but his kindness came at a price. They set upon him with fists and feet, and he was then bound and thrown into an underground dungeon. Unexpectedly, he encountered Judge Thalon there, who had also been captured. Finn and Murphy had kept watch outside the village until midnight. Then, using a tactic, Finn set the village's food storage on fire. In the chaos, he attempted to sneak into the village to search for people. However, he was discovered. Finn then took an old man hostage, demanding to know where the rest of their group were being held. Nyko said that their companions weren't there. Finn insisted on a thorough search, which Nyko agreed to, but even after combing through every corner of the village, there was no sign of Clark. What he did find, however, were their companions' clothes. Enraged, Finn grabbed the clothes, pointed his gun at Nyko, and demanded to know the whereabouts of the delinquents. Nyko admitted he had only seen one person, Octavia. Murphy realized that they might have just stumbled upon a pile of clothes, but Finn refused to believe it. By this time, he had lost his sanity and was stepping on a woman's feet in a fit of anger. Murphy urged him to leave while they still could. Finn barely managed to control his emotions and let the woman go. From their conversation, Nyko deduced that the one-eyed grounder had intentionally misled Finn and Murphy, who had unknowingly fallen into a trap in the one-eyed grounder's scheme of revenge. As Finn decided to leave, the old man taken as a hostage suddenly bolted, attempting to escape. Finn, mistaking this for an attack, opened fire. A boy, upon seeing this, charged in anger, and Finn continued to fire his weapon. More young people rose up in protest. Finn ignored the pleas of Murphy and Nyko and opened fire on every attacking villager. Clark and others, alerted by the sound of gunfire, rushed into the village. It was only when Finn saw Clark that he stopped firing, but it was too late. The village was strewn with bodies and filled with cries of anguish. Finn approached Clark, but she stepped back, shaking with cold. Upon returning to camp, Clark and Bellamy discussed how to return to Mount Weather to save the 100 delinquents. Raven also shared that Mount Weather had been jamming their signals all along, and the previous spaceship crash was the doing of these mountain men. She had located the signal tower. Abigail disagreed with them taking the risk alone, but understanding her daughter's resolve, she decided to bring a portion of the guard with them. The next morning, they set out together. Raven saw the transmission tower through the telescope, but at that moment, Abigail suddenly realized that Bellamy and Octavia were missing. Clark said they went to find the entrance to Mount Weather. Abigail was furious at their unilateral decision and immediately ordered a search. Finn picked up his gun, wanting to go with them, but everyone already saw him as a threat. Angry, Finn threw down his gun and stormed off. Clark followed him. Finn explained to her that it was an accident, but as they were talking, a toxic fog suddenly descended. Clark ran, warning her companions to find cover via the radio. Afterward, she and Finn took refuge in a bunker, where Clark spotted the corpse of the one-eyed grounder. Finn quickly covered the body, but he could clearly feel that Clark's gaze towards him had changed. He took out the watch that belonged to Clark's father, saying he had always been looking for a chance to give this watch to her. It was hanging around this grounder's neck. 
Clark couldn't help but tear up, but the thought of Finn shooting unarmed grounders troubled her heart once more. Meanwhile, the guards found Bellamy and Octavia, but as they did, the toxic fog hit. Following the trail of a bug, Octavia discovered a hidden cave, and they pulled open the door and entered, but some were too slow and were consumed by the fog. Inside, they found it was a garage and decided to split into two groups to act separately. Two guards were ambushed by Reapers. When Bellamy and Octavia arrived, the Reapers were gnawing on the guards' corpses. They managed to kill the Reapers, and in the nick of time, Octavia stopped her brother because she saw Lincoln. But Lincoln, who had been injected with the red drug, didn't recognize her at all. Octavia couldn't accept the reality of her boyfriend becoming a Reaper, but she joined her brother to knock out Lincoln and bring him back to the base. At Mount Weather, Dr. Singh joyfully reported to the president about Maya's post-blood transfusion indicators, stating that the healing properties of the 100's blood were eight times more effective than that of other outsiders. She requested to continue experiments on the remaining 47 delinquents. Cage was also persuading his father, but the president still did not consent. He couldn't treat these kids like animals, locking them in cages to force experiments on them. Later, the president approached Jasper, hoping he could encourage his peers to follow his example voluntarily and help more of the mountain people. However, this didn't work as the other delinquents refused to risk their lives and left the room. At that moment, Maya took Jasper and Monty to an unmonitored area, revealing that the last nuclear radiation leak was no accident. It turns out the mountain people believed the standard treatments were too slow and deliberately exposed her to radiation to coerce Jasper into compliance. Monty couldn't help but ask what the standard treatment was, so Maya led them both to the cells where hundreds of grounders were imprisoned in cages, practically a massive blood bank. Maya feared that they too might end up like this. Monty wanted to leave, but Maya explained that security had tightened since Clark's escape. Jasper then convinced Monty to volunteer as a way to buy more time to plan their collective escape. Seeing Monty join the volunteers, the president was confident and warned his son not to disobey his orders or engage in mischief behind his back. Meanwhile, the grounders locked a beautiful girl in the dungeon with Cain and Thalon, accusing them of seeking peace publicly while secretly sending assassins to slaughter their village. They announced that today, one of them must kill the other, and the survivor would be negotiated with for surrender terms. The leading grounder then left a knife and departed. The two hesitated, unwilling to fight. At that time, the grounder girl said the grounders wanted to seek justice. Thalon quickly learned of the massacre in the village, where 18 villagers were killed, all elderly and children. Cain insisted they were not involved, but the girl said it didn't matter. The grounder commander believed it was their doing, so one of them had to take the punishment. It was their way. If they refused, the commander would kill them both. After much contemplation, Cain picked up the knife, urging Thalon to kill him. Seeing her refusal, Cain cut his own left arm. Thalon hurried to bandage his wound. In a swift move, he took the girl hostage, shouting loudly. When the grounders came down, the girl instantly took the dagger from her throat, revealing that she was the real commander, Lexa. She then sent Thalon back to the Sky People's base with a message and kept Kane as a hostage. After the acid fog cleared, Clark and Finn regrouped with their group. Abigail informed her daughter that Raven had intercepted intelligence from Mount Weather, obtaining useful information for their rescue of the 100. They didn't destroy the radio tower. Just then, Thalon suddenly appeared before everyone, startling them all. He announced that the grounder commander had sent him back with a message. They could either choose to leave or choose death, with only two days to decide. The scene shifts to Mount Weather, where a girl from the 100 awoke in the woods, only to be terrified out of her wits in an instant. It turned out that Dr. Singh and Cage had used her as a test subject and released her outdoors. Shortly after, the girl's skin began to deteriorate rapidly. She panicked and begged to return, but Dr. Singh cruelly sacrificed her life. From this, the doctor concluded that the blood of the 100 could only temporarily immunize the mountain people. To achieve permanent immunity, they would need to obtain the source of the 100's blood, their bone marrow. Currently, there are nearly 400 mountain people, meaning on average, each of the delinquents would have to donate bone marrow to nine mountain people. This implies that all the remaining 47 delinquents would die after donating their bone marrow. She asked Cage to persuade the president to allow this proposal, suggesting that in this way, the mountain people could return to surface life within a month. 
Thus, Cage took his father outdoors, encouraging him to take off his mask and fully experience the beauty of life on the surface, hoping to tempt his father into consenting to extract the bone marrow from the remaining delinquents. But the sensible president did not agree. As soon as the news of the impending attack by the grounders was out, the camp was thrown into panic, with everyone feeling threatened. Thalon was urgently persuading everyone to pack up and evacuate quickly, but he had no comprehensive plan for after their departure. Clark couldn't agree with Thalon's decision, believing that if they left now, their companions trapped in Mount Weather would never be rescued. Abigail was torn, unsure of what choice to make. Afterward, Bellamy called Clark to the dropship where she was shocked to see Lincoln bound in chains. Lincoln's appearance was so altered that he was unrecognizable. The prisoners howled, trying to break free from their shackles. Clark realized that it was the mountain men who had created the Reapers. She noticed puncture wounds on Lincoln's neck and deduced he had been drugged. Just then, the iron ring securing the chains broke, and Lincoln lunged at them mercilessly. Thankfully, at the crucial moment, Octavia knocked Lincoln out with a rod. In the evening, Nico came secretly to find Octavia, informing her that their scouts had arrived and that Octavia needed to leave immediately if she wanted to survive. However, they heard Lincoln's cries. Octavia decided to take Nico to the dropship, where he found his friend Lincoln barely clinging to life. Nico prepared to help him end his suffering, but Clark stopped him. Suddenly, Lincoln stopped breathing, but Clark refused to give up. She pressed on Lincoln's chest and miraculously, he was revived. Clark had found a way to stop the grounder's assault. She immediately sought her mother, arguing that they had never been able to negotiate with the Grounders because they lacked a bargaining chip. The biggest threat to the Grounders at the moment was the Reapers created by the Mountain Men, and she could help the Grounders eliminate this threat permanently. As the Grounders advanced on their base, torches in hand, Clark volunteered to negotiate with them. Thalon thought she was wasting time and forced Abigail to agree with his decision and to evacuate quickly. However, Abigail decided to trust her daughter. Angered, Thalon ordered Abigail to be relieved of her command and had the trio imprisoned. Ironically, by that time, no one was willing to follow his orders, and he ended up being the one imprisoned. Clark later approached Commander Lexa alone, revealing she had escaped Mount Weather with Anya and producing a lock of Anya's hair, claiming Anya's dying wish was for the two sides to work together. She also mentioned that she could restore the Reapers to their original state, having already revived Lincoln. Lexa was intrigued and allowed Clark to show her Lincoln as proof. So Abigail and Finn went to the dropship to save Lincoln. Abigail injected Lincoln with an antipyretic, but after a struggle, Lincoln stopped breathing. Abigail began CPR, but to no avail. Realizing there was no hope, Abigail had to give up the resuscitation. However, Octavia, refusing to accept it, continued compressions on her boyfriend. Just then, Clark had brought Lexa onto the dropship. Upon witnessing the scene, Lexa felt betrayed, and tensions escalated with both sides readying their weapons for a standoff. At this critical moment, Abigail used a stun baton to deliver electric shocks to Lincoln. With one shock, then another, Lincoln miraculously came back to life once more, this time clearly calling out Octavia's name. Octavia was overwhelmed with emotion, tears filling her eyes. The grounders present were stunned, and Clark nodded to Lexa, tears of relief in her eyes. Back at Mount Weather, the delinquents had also begun to take action. They stealthily infiltrated the president's office in search of the truth. The computer whiz Monty cracked the president's computer password and found photos of their people living on Earth. However, as Monty was examining the architectural schematics of Mount Weather, Jasper suddenly realized that one girl of their group, Harper, was missing. He had a sinking feeling, and sure enough, Harper was found strapped to an operating table, with Dr. Singh forcefully extracting her bone marrow. As the drill started up, the girl's chicken screams of agony tore through the air. Commander Lexa agreed to a ceasefire, but on one condition that Finn must be handed over to pay for his killings in the village. Clark was shocked, and her smile vanished. Upon returning to camp under the watch of two grounders, Clark relayed the condition for peace. If they refused, the grounders would attack. Some suggested handing over Finn, pointing out that he had caused the loss of three months of oxygen and should have been exiled long ago according to their rules. Raven was furious and to defend Finn, she was ready to fight. It's then revealed that a year prior, Raven scored the highest on the zero gravity test but failed the medical exam, losing her chance to leave the Ark. Finn, wanting to fulfill Raven's dream, borrowed a spacesuit from the maintenance bay and opened the airlock to let Raven take a spacewalk. An unexpected oxygen leak occurred, and to prevent Raven from being exiled, Finn put on the spacesuit and took the blame, thus facing his confinement. 
But soon, the chief engineer, recognizing Raven's exceptional performance, overturned her medical rejection. Raven was racked with guilt. After the revelation, Clark and Bellamy comforted Finn, saying they had reinforced their defenses and no grounder could get through the electric fence to catch him. Then they went with Abigail to consult with Lincoln, who said that Commander Lexa would not let her people die in vain. If they didn't hand over Finn, she would kill everyone there. Lincoln added that although Finn had killed 18 villagers, Lexa was showing mercy by only demanding Finn's life in return. Abigail inquired about Finn's fate, and Lincoln explained that they would execute him by fire, then cut off his hands and tongue, allowing each person who lost a loved one to stab him. If Finn was still alive by sunrise, Lexa would end his life with a single sword strike. For the 18 lives he took, he would endure the pain of death 18 times before reconciliation. At this moment, Finn was packing his bags, ready to leave. He didn't want his mistake to put everyone in the camp in danger. Clark tried to console him, saying that he had acted in such a way to save his companions. Finn, however, confessed to her that he had done it all just to save her, and all he needed was her forgiveness. Although Clark was moved, she still couldn't forgive Finn. Outside the camp, the sounds of war drums grew louder as the grounders shouted for a blood-for-blood -blood retribution. Abigail opened the gate and told the remaining grounders that they would not hand over Finn, declaring that they were prepared to fight if it came to it. The grounders immediately turned their horses to go back with the news. Then Cain was released by the grounders. He suggested to Thalon that Finn should be tried for war crimes internally. Seeing Abigail's reluctance, Cain added that, given his understanding of the grounders, this might be the best outcome for Finn. Abigail then asked Lincoln if Commander Lexa would accept the verdict if they judged and sentenced Finn to imprisonment themselves. Lincoln replied that even if Lexa wanted to agree, she would likely be killed by sunrise for her weakness, as their people might kill a leader perceived as weak. He asked how they could talk about the value of life if Finn killed innocent people without a retribution, but Abigail still wanted to speak with Lexa for negotiation. Meanwhile, Finn and Clark had escaped the camp, planning to meet up with their companions at the dropship, but were ambushed by grounders. After knocking out Clark, the grounders prepared to attack Finn. Finn quickly drew his gun, but he no longer wanted to kill. He let the grounder go. Bellamy and Raven also arrived at the dropship. Soon after, Finn arrived with the unconscious Clark, filled with self-reproach. Abigail went to negotiate with Commander Lexa, but was stopped by her lieutenant, Indra, who threatened Abigail with a knife. Abigail argued that fighting amongst themselves would only benefit the mountain men, and that there must be a way to resolve this without bloodshed. Indra retorted bravery isn't the same as justice, insisting Finn must atone for his crimes with his life. Clark finally woke up, but by then the grounders had surrounded the dropship waiting for their moment. Suddenly, Raven aimed a gun at Murphy, intending to hand him over in Finn's place. Finn quickly stepped in front of Murphy and told everyone to keep to their posts. He gave Raven a hug as if to say goodbye. But while everyone was on guard, Finn surrendered himself to the grounders. As evening fell, the grounders outside the camp had lit torches, intending to make the Sky People watch as Finn was punished. Octavia wanted to save Finn, but was stopped by Kane. Raven implored Abigail not to just stand by, but Abigail felt helpless. Clark gave Octavia a glance, indicating her plan to speak with Lexa. Raven slipped a dagger to Clark with a directive to kill Commander Lexa if she wouldn't release Finn. Thus, Clark once again braved the grounder camp alone, facing the spears of Indra with determination to see Lexa and plead for Finn's life. But by then, the grounders had brought Finn forth and it was too late to save him. Clark requested a final farewell with Finn, which Lexa allowed. She went straight to Finn, tears streaming down, and kissed him. Finn admitted his fear and she comforted him, saying he would be all right. After Finn thanked her, he bowed his head. With tears in her eyes, Clark drew the bloodied dagger. When Finn's head dropped and his abdomen was covered in blood, everyone was shocked. Raven cried out, and Clark stood frozen in grief. She wiped her blood-stained hands, overwhelmed with agony. Seeing this, Lexa agreed to a truce and demanded Finn's body be handed over for a cremation ceremony with the victims. There was incessant arguing over this, but Clark agreed to Lexa's terms on the condition that they would discuss a rescue plan for the delinquents from Mount Weather once everything was over. Lexa consented, and Clark was instructed to choose companions for discussing the rescue plan at Lexa's camp. Raven resented Clark for killing Finn. Upon hearing that Finn's body had to be handed over, she insisted on accompanying Clark. Suddenly, Clark saw Finn opening his eyes, sending a chill down her spine. Along the way, she even saw the terrifying Finn standing among the trees by the road. 
Noticing Clark's distraught state, Octavia approached to comfort her, saying she understood her actions and offered to infiltrate Mount Weather. However, Clark did not agree, considering safety. Lexa's deputy disapproved of collaborating with the Sky People, deeming Clark and her companions as evil and fearing an alliance would destroy their own coalition. The group finally returned to the base camp of the Grounders, but as soon as they entered the village, villagers jumped out, opposing the visit of the Sky People. After Lexa punished the protesters, she declared that anyone obstructing the alliance would face severe penalties. After the cremation ceremony for the deceased, Lexa told Clark that she had also lost someone special and thought she would never recover from the pain, but she had since let go, realizing the true nature of love is vulnerability. She encouraged Clark that the dead are gone and the living must go on. Later, both parties dined together, and in a gesture of respect, Kane offered a bottle of fine wine. But when the deputy pre-tasted the wine, he showed signs of poisoning. The atmosphere tensed when the grounders found poison in Raven's coat. Commander Lexa ordered that no Sky person be allowed to leave and locked them all in a room. Soon, Indra took Raven away, claiming that the commander was merciful to only kill the culprit, shattering the potential alliance. They then hung Raven up and began to execute her with a knife. At that moment, Finn appeared again, fixated on the fallen wine cup, causing Clark to realize something. She rushed out, urging them to stop and brought forth the bottle of wine, drinking it all in front of everyone. Lexa was puzzled. Clark explained that the poison wasn't in the bottle, it was in the cup. The deputy quickly tried to convince Lexa it was a trick, but Bellamy noticed something was amiss. He deduced that the poisoner was actually the deputy, whose target wasn't Commander Lexa but the Alliance itself. The deputy didn't argue, believing the Alliance would doom the commander and not wanting to see her walk to her death. Heartbroken, Lexa declared that the deputy would pay for his betrayal with his life. Afterward, the Grounders released Raven and tied the deputy to a tree. The Grounders took turns cutting him until Lexa delivered the final blow to his heart, ending his life. At this point, Raven finally understood Clark's agonizing decision regarding Finn. Meanwhile, the remaining delinquents at Mount Weather still had no clue about Harper. Monty, however, made a new discovery. Pointing at the wiring diagram, he said this line could connect to the antenna on the surface and send a signal to the Ark so they could come to rescue them. They took tools to the location of the antenna at the end of the collectibles warehouse. They found the antenna's position and, under the cover of the alarm, managed to drill a hole in the wall to connect the antenna. Monty heard a familiar sound, the interference noise from the black box of the return shuttle before it crashed. The shuttle's crash must have been the work of the Mountain Men, who were now trying to disrupt the delinquent's contact with the Ark. After some efforts, Monty managed to send out the message, but the radio was in a frequency jammed by interference. The only way to remove the interference was to turn it off from the control center. So in the evening, Monty sneaked into a protective suit, disguised as a worker, and quietly turned off the interference. However, he was discovered while leaving and was captured. When Monty awoke, he found himself in a cage, next to the missing Harper, who they had been searching for days. She told him the mountain people had prepared 47 cages for each of them. Meanwhile, Raven received a distress signal from Mount Weather. Clark agreed to Bellamy's request because she needed someone at Mount Weather to coordinate on the inside, lower the mountain men's defenses, and turn off the acid fog. After finishing her explanation, she handed the map to Bellamy. Lincoln volunteered to accompany Bellamy on the mission. This time, when Finn reappeared, Clark told him that love is weakness. Finn then disappeared into the darkness. Abigail brought Finn's ashes, and Clark told her mother that she had moved on. Lincoln and Bellamy set out overnight, lying at the mine entrance nearest to Mount Weather, ready to infiltrate. They planned to attack the Reapers as soon as the door was opened and Bellamy would slip inside, posing as a fleeing grounder. However, Lincoln hesitated, wanting to retreat. Bellamy convinced him to stay, saying that as soon as the mountain men brought out the red drug, he should seize it and run, which would cause chaos among the captured grounders. While they were discussing this, the Reapers had already arrived, so Lincoln tied Bellamy to a post, pretending to be captured with his eyes covered. Elsewhere, Indra was ordered to lead her troops to the Sky People's base camp early in the morning for combat training. Thalon believed that allying with the Grounders was a mistake, but Kane thought that there were enough resources for everyone. If they could make the Grounders realize that sharing resources was beneficial, there would be no problem. Kane wanted to teach the Grounders how to shoot, but Indra stepped forward to stop him. Confused, Kane asked if guns could save their lives, but it seemed they were very afraid of them. 
Octavia explained that according to the Grounders, if any of them picked up a gun, even to kill one of their own, the Mountain Men would destroy their entire village since they didn't allow the Grounders to have the capacity to retaliate. Octavia asked a Grounder to spar with her. Although she was no match for him, she showed no fear and fought with all her might. Indra admired Octavia's determination and later approached her, saying that if Octavia was willing to become her second, she would train her to be an even better warrior. Octavia gladly accepted. At the base camp of the Sky People, Clark is discussing plans to attack Mount Weather. However, things are not going smoothly. The Sky People advocate for a direct assault on the front gates using fire, while Clark believes they should wait for their inside ally Bellamy to reach Mount Weather, lower their defenses, and shut down the acid fog before they make a move. Clark steps outside for some fresh air, but hears the howling of a monster from the woods. Realizing the danger, Lexa calls Clark and her subordinate, and they quickly flee. Clark finds a cave entrance and signals for them to take refuge inside. To their horror, they discover it's a feeding ground for beasts. Suddenly, a massive gorilla bursts out of the forest, heading straight for the subordinate and quickly overpowers him. Clark quickly draws her gun and fires multiple shots, but the creature born with big muscles is seemingly bulletproof. With no other option, they decide to jump down, but Lexa has injured her leg. Clark refuses to abandon her, helps her up, and they continue to run. After a long struggle with the gorilla, they manage to crawl through an iron gate, trapping it outside. Lexa says that a good leader must make tough choices. She had seen Clark's strength, but now she wavered, and that's her weakness. Clark retorts that she saved her because she needed her because they couldn't let anyone else become the commander. Lexa smiles, saying that even if she died, her spirit would make the wise choice and it would find the next commander. Clark asks how their leaders are chosen, just as the gorilla discovers them and tries to break through the iron gate. Clark removes the sword fixed on the gate. The gorilla tumbles in, and while it's still disoriented, Clark and Lexa make their escape, securing the iron gate behind them. Meanwhile, Thalon offers Murphy his pistol in exchange for being taken to his son Wells' grave. Murphy reveals the cause of Wells' death, which deeply pains Thalon. However, Thalon still believes that sending the 100 to Earth was not a mistake. He says that sometimes the greater good must be considered, and sacrifices are necessary as they might lead to a positive outcome. Murphy disagrees, saying that such actions don't necessarily yield good results, and that he had been pardoned and had turned over a new leaf, but people still treat him like trash. Thalon tells him about a place called the City of Light, which can accommodate them all. The next morning, Murphy opened his eyes to find dozens of people gathered outside the rocket ship, ready to accompany Thalon to the legendary City of Light. Spurred on by Thalon's encouragement, Murphy decided to join them on the scouting journey. Clark awoke to the goose roars of the gorilla, while Lexa looked on at her admiringly, saying that Clark isn't weak at all. Inspired by Lexa, Clark conceived a strategy to deal with the mountain men, saying they didn't need to break in, and all they needed was for their inside man to release the mountain people, and she believed Bellamy was up to the task. At that moment, Bellamy and Lincoln had entered the tunnels. Dr. Tsing designated Bellamy for the blood. As Lincoln received his injection, he couldn't resist the temptation and went forward, accepting the injection despite Bellamy shaking his head. In a haze, Lincoln saw Bellamy being taken away by the mountain men. He was chained and injected with drugs before being taken to the blood bank. When Bellamy woke up in the cell, a grounder girl beside him urged him to stay quiet, explaining that the mountain men take the strongest for blood transfusions. However, when she learned Bellamy was from the Sky People, she spat on him in disgust. Soon after, when the mountain men came to take the girl away, Bellamy struggled fiercely, causing them to change their minds. They stunned Bellamy with electricity, injected him with drugs, and hung him upside down, turning him into a living blood supply. Meanwhile, Harper and Monty's disappearance left Jasper anxious. He couldn't help himself and went to the president's office alone. In a fit of emotion, Jasper took the president hostage, only to find out that the president was a highly skilled man who quickly disarmed him. However, the president didn't blame Jasper. Instead, he ordered his men to find his son and Dr. Tsing immediately. Just as Dr. Tsing was preparing to extract more bone marrow from Harper, the president and his men arrived, ordering Dr. Tsing to be detained and releasing Monty and Harper. Jasper was told to return to the dormitory and inform his friends to pack their belongings and prepare to go home. When the president confronted his son, he discovered that his men had already turned on him, following his son's commands instead. Cage declared that everyone wanted to return to life on the surface. He then ordered his men to take his father to the quarantine zone. 
Elsewhere, as Clark and her party were returning to their camp, they were ambushed by the mountain men and narrowly escaped with their lives. Indra intervened just in time, killing the mountain man poised to shoot. A grounder was hit by a bullet, but luckily Octavia managed to capture one of the Mountain Men assassins and found a photo of the assassination targets in his backpack. It's none other than Clark and Lexa. Heeding Indra's command, her men rushed to alert the village base and then followed Clark back to camp. The injured grounder succumbed to blood loss and could not be saved. In a cruel twist of fate, Emerson, the mountain men assassin they had saved, refused to speak. Kane suggested opening the airlock to let in radiation to coerce the captured, but Abigail opposed the idea. That's when Clark discovered a frequency emitter among the captives' belongings, a device they had seen before in the tunnels, which could be used against the Reapers. Raven claimed she could replicate the frequency. Abigail found unusual genetic markers in the mountain men's blood, markers that are only present in people born on the Ark. From this, Clark deduced that the mountain men were harvesting the blood of the 100. Infuriated, she wanted to open the airlock, but Kane and Abigail stopped her. At that moment, Maya was reviewing dialysis records in the medical bay, searching for Harper and Monty's whereabouts. She finally found a clue in a patient's file who had completed dialysis ahead of schedule. She managed to send the guard away under pretense and quietly made her way to the blood bank where she stumbled upon Bellamy hanging upside down. As she was about to wake Bellamy and help him down, a guard entered the room. Bellamy had to pretend to be dead, and then he attacked the guard by surprise. With Maya and the grounder girl's help, they killed the guard. Bellamy changed into the guard's uniform and disposed of the body in the tunnels. Seeing Maya's shaken demeanor, Bellamy didn't want to involve her further, but Maya insisted on seeing it through to the end. Afterward, they left the blood bank, and as they passed the nursery, Bellamy happened to see the son of the guard he had just killed, leaving him with a heavy heart. Later, Bellamy joined Maya at the dorm entrance, but suddenly, alarms blared, and the doors were swiftly locked. Bellamy quickly asked Maya to lead him to the radio. Clark finally received a transmission over the radio and heard Bellamy's voice. Bellamy reported that the remaining delinquents were locked in the dorms and the mountain men had begun to harvest their blood. The situation was likely to deteriorate rapidly and there were children involved. He hoped Clark would come up with a plan that wouldn't end in a bloodbath. Clark instructed Bellamy to find a way to free the imprisoned grounders, hoping to harness their strength to overthrow the mountain men's stronghold. Meanwhile, Cage had moved his father's belongings into the quarantine room and officially took over the presidential office. Clark took the captive Emerson away from the airlock door, and when her mother tried to intervene, she firmly stated she was in charge here and she knew what was right. Abigail relented. Clark instructed Emerson to deliver a message to the Mountain Men's president that they are coming to settle the score. The Grounder's army is stronger than he can imagine. Neither the acid fog nor the Reapers pose a threat to them. After her speech, she set Emerson's oxygen supply to last only six hours, forcing him to run back to deliver the message. Emerson ran desperately and finally made it back to Mount Weather before his oxygen ran out. Meanwhile, Dr. Tsing had successfully cured Cage with the spy people's bone marrow. He was no longer afraid of radiation and continued to abduct members of the remaining delinquents for bone marrow transplants. She told Jasper that the president was no longer in power and said to them that the delinquents are irreplaceable to them. Bellamy informed Clark via radio that the lives of the delinquents were under threat, with people being taken from the dorms every few hours. Maya discovered a narrow passage in the ventilation system diagrams that led to the lab. Clark instructed Bellamy to find their taken companions and quickly locate the source of the acid fog. Turning it off was critical because failure meant losing everything. Subsequently, Clark assigned Kane to go to the village base in her place to meet with the grounders. She couldn't leave until she confirmed the safety of the delinquents. At that moment, Abigail learned that Thalon had already left camp with 20 people two days prior, promising to return to rescue their companions after reaching the City of Light. Thalon and his group arrived in the desert and encountered a masked girl. She said she and her brother had intended to go to the City of Light but were attacked by desert scavengers along the way. Murphy gave her his water to drink, and Thalon invited her to join their group on the journey. Murphy and the girl struck up a conversation, during which she removed her gloves to reveal her deformed hands, saying her people saw her as a stain on their bloodline and cast her out. Murphy was both sympathetic and shocked, maintaining his composure to avoid embarrassing her. However, as they walked, a man suddenly appeared, carrying a rocket launcher and riding a Ferrari horse. It turned out he was with the girl. 
In an instant, the girl turned hostile, took Murphy hostage with a knife, and demanded their weapons and supplies. After whispering a few words to Murphy, she punched him in the face and swaggered away. Back at Mount Weather, Bellamy followed the heart-wrenching screams to the lab. Over the intercom, Clark heard the news of a companion dying from excessive bone marrow extraction, as well as Cage's conversation with the assassin Emerson. To her horror, Cage planned to launch a missile at the Grounder's village base that very night, intending to destroy them all. She then instructed Raven to prepare, while she herself, escorted by the Grounders, hurried to the village base. She held a confidential meeting with Commander Lexa and informed her about the imminent missile attack from Mount Weather, urging immediate evacuation of the Grounders. However, Lexa, fearing that such an action would arouse suspicion among the Mountain Men, refused to evacuate her people. She argued that sometimes sacrifices must be made for the greater good. But she reminded her that war always comes with casualties and urged her not to let emotions cloud her judgment. Meanwhile, Dr. Singh and the guards came to take more people, Bellamy blended in with the group and secretly passed a pistol to Jasper, instructing him to alert everyone to be ready to fight back the next time they came to take people. Jasper suggested that Bellamy seek help from the captured president. Bellamy pretended to deliver food and found him. The president said he couldn't help the delinquents escape, but would try to buy them time. In the woods, Octavia discovered Lincoln being drugged, standing over an unconscious companion, seemingly on the verge of doing something regrettable. Octavia pushed him away. Lincoln, filled with self-reproach, said he simply couldn't resist the temptation. Octavia informed him that Bellamy had successfully infiltrated Mount Weather. She urged Lincoln to return with her. When Lincoln hesitated, Octavia declared that grounders never give up and they would fight to the end. At that moment, Clark followed Lexa as they quietly left the village base. She looked back at the village with reluctance and said if they could find the spotter who would be responsible for selecting the missile's landing site, perhaps they could divert the missile off course. Just then, she was shocked to find that her mother had also arrived at the village base. Ignoring her own safety, Clark dashed back to the village. Meanwhile, the spotter from the mountain men had already reported the final coordinates to their base. Clark urged her mother to leave quickly. At the same time, Indra and Kane realized that Clark and Lexa were missing and prepared to search the forest for them. It was at this moment that Cage gave the order to launch the missile. The village base was instantly engulfed in flames. Abigail then realized that Clark knew about the missile and did nothing. But Clark explained that it was all to protect Bellamy and urged her mother to keep it a secret. Otherwise, the fragile alliance they had formed would surely break and their defeat would be inevitable. Abigail retorted that even if they won the war, Clark could never cleanse herself of this sin. Clark, filled with self-reproach, shed tears. Meanwhile, the remaining delinquents at Mount Weather were ready to fight as planned. When Dr. Tsing came to take more people, they fiercely resisted, but Jasper was still captured. However, as they were about to enter the elevator, a radiation leak occurred. Jasper knew this had to be Bellamy's handiwork. He directed his group to disperse and had Monty sabotage the surveillance cameras. As Dr. Singh tried to crawl into the elevator to escape, Jasper blocked the elevator, watching with satisfaction as the executioner of his people suffered and took her last breath. As evening approached, Murphy awoke. He remembered the masked girl saying they should head due north. If they could get there, she would lead her people to the City of Light. But now, with all supplies taken by the masked girl, disagreements arose among the group. Thalon allowed his followers to make their own choice. He would continue north, following Murphy. At Mount Weather, Cage confronted his father, accusingly reporting that he had destroyed the village base. He boasted that with Clark and Lexa dead, the barbarians would turn on each other, allowing them to reap the benefits and reclaim their lost territory. Upon hearing this, the president was outraged, exclaiming that the cost was the loss of Cage's soul. Seeing they were at an impasse, Cage ordered his men to inject his father with the bone marrow serum extracted from the delinquents. In the meantime, Octavia and Lincoln returned to the now-leveled village. Hearing the mournful wails and cries of their companions, they were saddened. Abigail, seeing the innocent villagers in turmoil, felt a deep unease. Octavia reassured her not to worry, confident that Clark was still alive. Abigail felt even more remorse upon hearing this. Lincoln had to exert tremendous effort to pull Indra from the rubble, but she was fearful of Lincoln, who had been turned into a reaper. Then they were ambushed by a sniper. Seizing the opportunity, Lincoln carried the wounded Indra to his friend, Dr. Nyko, asking Octavia to stay and help while he went to take out the sniper. Before losing consciousness, Indra instructed Octavia to save her people before she passed out. 
At that moment, Abigail discovered someone trapped under the rubble. She dug through, creating a gap to crawl into where she found Cain lying there, his leg pinned down by a heavy beam, bleeding profusely but luckily without any broken bones. The beam was too heavy for Abigail to move an inch. Desperate, she tried using a crowbar, and that's when she realized Cain's artery had been torn. It was the weight of the beam that had kept him alive until now. Cain urged Abigail to go find Clark, to which Abigail responded with a heavy heart, assuring him that both she and Lexa would be all right. Suddenly, a collapse occurred, and both of them passed out. Octavia observed that if she could reach the crater on the opposite side, she could climb into the ruins from the side to rescue her companions. But a direct approach was out of the question. She then threw a bottle of strong liquor onto the ground, causing a burst of flames and billowing white smoke. Seizing the moment, Octavia ran into the crater, and with some followers, she began to dig through the stones. After some time, Abigail came to her senses and started talking to Cain, fearing he would slip away. She felt immense guilt and confessed to Cain that her daughter had already known about the incoming missile. Cain did not blame Clark, acknowledging that her actions were learned from their ways. She simply made her own choice, just as they had made theirs when they executed their own people for theft of medicine and food, or when they extracted the breath from the parents' lungs to save their children. They had to pay for their sins. Lincoln arrived in the forest and was surprised to see Clark and Lexa. Then the three of them searched for the hidden sniper while staying concealed. Dawn broke and the sniper spotted them. Clark drew the fire away, allowing Lincoln to ambush from behind. The sniper was caught off guard when Lincoln suddenly picked up a high-frequency transmitter, causing him intense head pain. The sniper then took Lincoln hostage with a dagger. Despite Lincoln's insistence that Clark save their friends instead of worrying about him, she replied he was her friend and fired a bullet that went through Lincoln's shoulder and hit the sniper's heart. Then, the sound of victory resounded. Cain stopped talking, and Abigail realized he was losing blood fast, his life hanging by a thread. With all her strength, she crawled out from the debris, reached Cain's side, and used a rope to tie off his bleeding wound to stop the blood loss. Finally, they awaited rescue. The chief engineer led a team that pulled them both out from the wreckage. At the same time, the delinquents trapped in Mount Weather had taken over the fifth floor. They pretended to be dazed by the red fog and suddenly rose up to fight against the guards. Emerson had no choice but to withdraw the guards. The initial victory invigorated the spirits of the delinquents. Just then, a scream pierced the air. A girl had been captured by the guards without anyone noticing. But Bellamy quickly rescued the girl, and they both returned home with Maya. Maya pleaded with her father to take the two in. It turned out that both of Maya's parents were opposed to the movement of using outsiders' blood, with her mother having died prematurely for refusing treatment. Her father agreed to shelter Bellamy, but after they split up, Maya was soon taken hostage by Cage. Cage forced Jasper to surrender, or Maya would suffocate in 20 minutes. Maya told Jasper that Bellamy would bring weapons through the refuse chute. However, the chute had just been sabotaged by Monty for safety reasons, but it could still be repaired. In a race against time, Bellamy crawled out of the chute and placed Maya inside to escape. Maya was saved thanks to her father's help. Bellamy told Jasper that Clark would bring an army of grounders to rescue them. Jasper was a bit surprised. It seemed Finn's dream of peace had come true. But Bellamy said no more. Half an hour later, Cage and his hitman Emerson stormed the room with their guards, only to find it empty. Maya had brought more mountain men who opposed the blood experiment, and they had hidden the delinquents in groups. Bellamy urged Jasper and Monty to prepare for the imminent battle. As evening fell, Lincoln, Clark, and Lexa returned to the village base. Lexa rallied everyone, declaring that they would not suffer in silence, that Mount Weather would fall and a blood debt would be repaid with blood. Abigail interrupted, reminding them that there were still survivors buried under the rubble and urging them to rescue them. Indra praised Octavia for her actions and instructed her to take her gear and set out with her and Lexa the next day. She had finally accepted Lincoln. Clark knew her mother wouldn't forgive her, but the priority was to rescue the remaining delinquents quickly. The fact that the sniper wasn't wearing protective gear meant the bone marrow treatment was working and the delinquents' lives were in danger at any moment. Before leaving, Abigail reminded her daughter not to forget that they were on the good side, hoping they would meet again. As dusk approached, Thalon and his group continued their journey northward to the City of Light. Suddenly, someone stepped on a landmine, blowing them sky high. Yet another mine detonated. Thalon ordered everyone to freeze and not to make any moves. After enduring a night of wind and sand, they finally saw the first light of dawn. 
The wind ceased, and a strange glow appeared on the horizon. Thalon was convinced that this was the City of Light, and the landmines were merely a test of their faith. He took the lead, and they cautiously made their way forward, carefully diffusing mines as they went. They finally cleared the minefield, their spirits uplifted, and they moved with a spring in their step. However, cresting the hill, they were met with a desolate sight. There was no sign of life, just barrenness. Meanwhile, Commander Lexa had assembled the coalition of twelve grounder clans in the forest, setting up camp and standing by for orders. They were ready to attack as soon as Bellamy turned off the acid fog. Clark felt uneasy and reproached herself for sending Bellamy into danger. Stepping out of her tent, she went to talk to Octavia, who had already suspected something was amiss. Upon learning that Clark knew about the missile before the attack, Octavia was furious, accusing her of sending the villagers to their deaths for nothing. Clark was full of guilt and begged Octavia not to tell anyone else, fearing the alliance would crumble. Frustrated, Octavia stormed off. Lexa sensed something was wrong and sent Octavia to stand guard in the woods, plotting to eliminate her to prevent any future problems. But Clark warned Lexa not to interfere, confident that Octavia wouldn't disclose anything. However, Lexa secretly ordered her deputy to take Octavia out. Fortunately, Clark reacted quickly and prevented it just in time. She angrily confronted Lexa, declaring she couldn't sacrifice her people anymore. If Lexa dares to harm Octavia in any way, she will tell everyone about the missile. They parted on bad terms. At Mount Weather, Bellamy discovered that his keycard no longer worked. Realizing he had been exposed, he faced two guards aiming their guns at him. Bellamy quickly fled, engaging in a scuffle with the guards and managing to knock one down, seizing their keycard. He sought help from Maya's father, who had already prepared an alternate escape route for him. Bellamy then reached the source of the acid fog, where the mechanic, through radio communication, guided Bellamy to the control panel that could shut off the fog. He directed Bellamy to a passivation feature under which they could neutralize the acid fog with a base. Soon, the sound of water pumps starting up filled the air, and the screen eventually showed that passivation was complete, which filled everyone with excitement. At dusk, Lexa told Clark that she had decided to release Octavia because she trusted her. She knew their ways were too cruel, but this was how the Grounders had survived so far. Then, to everyone's surprise, Lexa kissed Clark, who did not reject her juicy tongue. However, Clark expressed that she wasn't ready to fall in love again. She needed time. Just then, a flare shot across the sky, showing that Bellamy had succeeded in his plan. Clark felt a huge sense of relief. Lexa then ordered the sounding of the war horns. Battle was imminent. To celebrate their temporary victory, Raven kissed the mechanic. Soon after, Lexa and Clark, leading the coalition of twelve grounder clans, marched mightily toward Mount Weather. But then, Bellamy suddenly noticed an instrument panel. He saw that the pH value had not changed, even though the controller's screen clearly showed that neutralization had occurred. He immediately used the walkie-talkie to contact Raven, hoping she could warn Clark to stop the advancing army. It turned out to be a trap set by Emerson. Cage ordered a quick reset of the console and commanded his men to capture Bellamy in the chem lab. Realizing he had been duped and with guards about to charge in, Bellamy took an ethylene torch and hid in the same passage he had come through. The guards, wary of the oxygen tanks exploding, didn't dare shoot until they heard the last of Bellamy's bullets, and then they followed him into the tunnel. However, just as Cage was preparing to release the acid fog when the Coalition entered attack range, Bellamy ignited the oxygen tanks with the ethylene torch. Flames shot into the air, and the lab exploded in a fiery bloom, causing the mountain men to fail in releasing the acid fog. Now Cage was out of options, with only the final defense at the gate remaining. The next day, Raven woke up as if she had become a different person. She coldly dressed and ignored the shitty mechanic, who told her that his feelings were sincere. As the army marched on, Clark moved Octavia to a safer position in the rear guard, but Octavia was unappreciative. Indra, aware of Octavia's distress, told her that it was the enemy who wanted to kill them, not Clark and Lexa. She adds that Lexa's ruthlessness is precisely why she excels, and it's why they can win the war. As the sun set in the west, Thalon and his party arrived in front of rows of solar panels. Murphy picked up a stone and threw it, unexpectedly activating a drone. They chased the drone to the riverside where a wooden Tesla boat was moored. Thalon exclaimed they needed a boat, and as if by fate, there it was. The City of Light was before their eyes, and they were bound to find it. Inspired by Thalon, the four of them boarded the Tesla boat without battery and rowed vigorously forward. 
Bellamy kept his promise, rescued the Grounder girl, and enlisted her help to organize the imprisoned Grounders, standing by for orders. Cage, furious with embarrassment, warned the residents that if the delinquents were not handed over within an hour, they would be treated as traitors. When the guards searched an elderly couple's home and threatened them with a gun, Jasper and Maya surrendered voluntarily and begged the guards to spare them. Unexpectedly, the guards shot the couple. Just then, Monty blocked the guard's path, and as one of the guards approached him, Bellamy ambushed him from the corridor, shooting him dead. Miller took the opportunity to strangle another guard with handcuffs. Then Bellamy led Jasper and Maya to rescue the other delinquents, directing others to meet up with the grounders in the harvest chamber. Meanwhile, Clark was explaining the battle plan to the leaders of the 12 grounder clans. She said it was a rescue mission with the primary objective to save their companions and to avoid unnecessary killing. The rescue plan was divided into four teams, with specific responsibilities. The gate of Mount Weather seemed impenetrable, but its electromagnetic lock system would fail without electricity. The power inside the mountain came from the Philpot Dam hydroelectric plant. Raven's team was tasked with blowing up the dam's power source, which would break the gate's locks. However, there was also a backup power station inside the mountain. Therefore, the only chance was the one-minute window before the backup power kicked in. Although they could blow up the backup power station from the inside, a prolonged power outage would kill everyone. Once the gate was open, the enemy would attack fiercely. At that time, another team would need to delay as much as possible to draw the enemy's attention. Meanwhile, Indra's team would take the opportunity to escort the rescued delinquents through the Reaper tunnels to escape. When everyone had escaped, they would blow the retreat horn. In this way, they would return to camp before the mountain people realized their escape. A helpless cage turned to his father for help. His father accused his son of intending to ignite war amongst races and underestimating their enemies. However, as Cage was about to leave, his father still called out to his son. At this moment, a team had already drilled a hole in the door of Mount Weather and had placed a bomb, waiting for ignition. Raven and the mechanic had just finished setting up bombs on three turbines when they were attacked. The mechanic managed to subdue the assailant, but their actions had been exposed. One of the bombs was damaged, but they made use of a disaster failure to cripple the system and managed to blow up the three turbines before the guards arrived. Then, pretending to surrender, the two backed away just as the fourth turbine was also blown sky high. Mount Weather lost power. Lincoln started the one-minute countdown timer, but there was no response. Clark realized that the mountain people were jamming the signal. They had to ignite the bomb manually. A few soldiers advanced towards the door with shields, but they were unsuccessful. With less than 10 seconds left, Lincoln shot an arrow that detonated the bomb. Lexa quickly led her troops to the ridge to eliminate the machine gunners and instructed Lincoln and Clark to stay together. When the shooting stopped, they would open the door. At the same time, Mount Weather initiated their Level 1 containment protocol and residents rushed to the fifth level. Bellamy and his group hurried to a house to rescue people, but suddenly discovered that the house owner was already lying at her doorstep. It seemed that the house owner had provided shelter for the last 12 members of the delinquents. At that moment, Monty emerged, saying that he hid himself and watched helplessly as the guard killed the house owner without intervening, and he was overwhelmed with guilt. Then a few of them dashed towards the harvest chamber. The shooting on the ridge had already stopped. Lexa must have taken out the machine gunners. Lincoln led his companions to open the door. As everyone cheered with joy, Commander Lexa and Hitman Emerson walked side by side towards them, as though they were not enemies against each other. Then, the imprisoned ground people began to emerge from the door one after another. Clark looked puzzled at Lexa. She understood that there must have been some deal struck between Lexa and the mountain people. It turns out, the mountain men agreed to release all the ground people in exchange for Lexa withdrawing her troops, but the delinquents were not included in the deal. This betrayal came too suddenly, and Clark stared at Lexa, speechless. At this moment, the doors of Mount Weather were slowly closing. Lexa ordered the retreat horn to be sounded. Lincoln wanted to stay and help Clark, but Lexa did not allow it and ordered her men to detain Lincoln. Subsequently, Lexa led the ground forces to leave. Indra, who was waiting in the Reaper tunnels, heard the retreat horn and felt puzzled. Indra had no choice but to order the team to retreat. Octavia, who wanted to save her companions, refused to leave. Because of this, Indra made it clear to Octavia that from now on, she was no longer her second in command. Bellamy and his group rushed to the harvest chamber, only to see Maya's father already sacrificed. Maya was stricken with grief. By this time, the harvest chamber had already been emptied. The mechanic and Raven had just woken up from unconsciousness when the guards arrived and took both of them away. 
Cage informed his father that Lexa had accepted his deal, but his father cautioned not to be too pleased too soon, since the peace made with the Grounders would not be enough for them to safely set foot on the ground. The Sky People will not give up. Clark stared at the doors of Mount Weather and vowed not to let things end there. In search of the City of Light, the remaining four led by Thalon boarded a Tesla boat to chase the drone, rowing out to sea as the sky gradually darkened. Just when they lost hope, they saw a light in the distance, which must have been land. They were overjoyed. As one of them reached out to pick up an oar, they were suddenly dragged down by an unknown creature. Murphy reached out to save his companion, but was bitten on the arm. Then the creature broke through the bottom of the boat. To save himself, Thalon pushed the boy into the water. The creature instantly rose up and swallowed him whole. Murphy watched, dumbfounded. Thalon frantically rowed towards the shore, finally reaching the land. Murphy, disdainful of associating with him, made it clear he wanted nothing to do with him. At that moment, the drone appeared again and Thalon chased after it. At this moment, Octavia was anxiously guarding the trash chute in the tunnel. Clark soon ran into the tunnel as well. Upon learning the truth about Commander Lexa's betrayal, Octavia reproached Clark for trusting her too much. Just then, Bellamy emerged with Jasper and Monty. The two survivors embraced, having narrowly escaped death. They decided that Octavia and Jasper would escort Maya to level 5 to look for oxygen tanks, while the others sought help from the overthrown president. As evening fell, Indra came to Lincoln's side and explained that according to the ceasefire terms, the grounders were forbidden from setting foot around Mount Weather. If he disobeyed, Lexa would not come to his rescue. Octavia made her choice. Now it was Lincoln's turn. After saying this, Indra left a dagger and walked away. Lincoln didn't hesitate to pull out the dagger. Meanwhile, the mountain men continued extracting bone marrow from the delinquents. Emerson led a team to the main base and brought back Abigail, Kane, and others as captives. Currently, they were extracting marrow from Raven, who was overpowered despite fighting back with all her might. The group found the president, but he refused to help. Left with no other choice, they brought him to the command center. On the screen, they saw the harrowing footage of Raven's bone marrow extraction and the bound Abigail and others. Yet he still refused to assist. Clark took over the radio and ordered Cage to release the prisoners. However, Cage was resolute in his stance. Clark, with tears in her eyes, shot the president and warned Cage if he didn't release them, she would release radiation on level 5. But Cage remained deluded and secretly ordered Emerson to kill Clark and her group, while he himself went straight to extract Abigail's marrow as retribution. Maya finally reached level 5 before running out of oxygen. They planned to kill Cage. Later, Maya found a sergeant and learned that Cage was in the dormitory extracting bone marrow. Jasper pretended to be captured by the sergeant and headed to the dormitory, ready to take his chance to kill Cage. Octavia and Maya stayed in a room on standby. However, a couple stumbled into the room, terrified by their attire. They screamed and fled. Octavia quickly followed, efficiently killing two guards, but more guards arrived. At that moment, Emerson had reached the command center and was breaking in. The surveillance showed Octavia being arrested and Maya leading Octavia into the cafeteria, surrounded by guards. At that time, Monty announced his success in hacking the system. Pulling the lever would release radiation. As Emerson was about to detonate the bomb, Clark placed her hand on the lever after watching her companions and mother in danger on the monitor. Bellamy also reached out for his sister. Together, they pulled the lever. Instantly, the airlock and vents opened, reversing the ventilation system to suck in outside air. Jasper was about to use his dagger when he noticed the guard's skin beginning to blister. Cage realized the gravity of the situation and quickly fled. Jasper, desperate, rushed out to find Maya. He arrived at the cafeteria to see the mountain men, who were vulnerable to radiation, dying one after the other. Jasper took the dying Maya, unbearable to watch his love die in his arms. Octavia burst into the dormitory to unlock the handcuffs for everyone. The group made their way to the cafeteria, hearts heavy with guilt upon seeing the room full of dead bodies, including innocent children. They reached the dormitory where Clark told her mother she tried her best to be a good person. Abigail nodded with understanding and they embraced. At this moment, Cage had already escaped from Mount Weather alone. When he saw Lincoln, he pulled out a high-frequency emitter. Lincoln's head instantly throbbed with pain, and he collapsed to the ground. Cage was about to inject him with the red liquid, trying to make him turn into a powerful reaper. But he didn't expect Lincoln to endure the pain and chop off his left hand. Cage howled like a goose in agony. Then Lincoln picked up the red liquid and injected it into Cage's body. 
By this time, Clark had brought everyone back to the camp, but she refused to go inside. Even as Bellamy comforted her using words but not his tongue, she couldn't forgive herself for the lost lives of her companions. After an embrace with Bellamy, she left alone. The scene shifts to Murphy, who woke up by the boat's side and accidentally kicked a solar panel. As he pried it open, the sound of machinery started. He followed the noise through a door. It was a veritable paradise, with everything one could need. He munched on the cookies, nodding his head to the music, thoroughly enjoying himself. He casually pressed the remote, only to see a young man appear on the TV, who said in pain that he could have stopped her, but he lost control, making her get the launch codes. After saying that, the young man shot himself in the chest. At the same time, Thalon followed a drone to a building. Curiously, he walked in and was greeted by a holographic projection of a woman named Ali, an artificial intelligence. Without exchanging too many pleasantries or hormones, Ali told Thalon that he was destined to come to the City of Light, and she realized it when she received his gift. She then thanked Thalon for bringing her the missile, indicating that some shocking secrets are yet to be revealed. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.